So let's talk today about condors. A lot of times we hear about the problems of endangered species, the problem of things going extinct, the problem of there being fewer and fewer species and individuals on Earth. It's important to say that we do know how to do recovery, right? Maybe not every single site in every single situation, but in general, we've figured out over the last many decades ways to recover rare species. And perhaps the best example of this anywhere in the world, certainly in the US, is right here in Ventura County. And that's our California condor, the story of the California condor. <laughs> so I want to tell you guys that story today and, and tell you how we've been, um, in my view, uh, relatively successful. We're, we're, not, we're not succeeded yet. We haven't completely succeeded. We're not out of the woods by any means, but um, this is a conservation success story. And you guys should know this as graduates from a conservation biology class. So when people say we can't recover endangered species, at a minimum you can put forth the condor example. Uh, okay, let's go. To start off with, let's talk a little bit about condors themselves. They are uh, these, these charismatic critters, maybe not engendering love, but they certainly engender a lot of feelings. And uh, certainly for some of our um, uh, folks that have resided in the area of condor country, they've been very important symbols in, in spiritual senses, in cultural senses, etc. So, our California condor is a vulture, so is something that's going to feed on dead stuff. Therefore, um, this guy's head is bald, like me. I'm kind of like a condor. So as an adult, if you look on the right here, as an adult, that, that head will look pinkish. And uh, why is that? Well, why might these vultures have featherless heads? Because they get all gross from you. Right, they're going to be poking their head into dead, rotten guts and stuff. And so clearly, um, there's been some selection pressure to not, to be bald, right? To not have hair and things that could maybe trap a piece of meat that would then kind of rot and get infected and, you know, that kind of stuff. So clean in, clean out is the idea. So the most, char the most ca characteristic feature of these guys and other vultures is the, the naked head. The adults are big. And let me ask you, while we're talking, let me pass these around. So these are uh, my condor skull and replica egg. So uh, you know, don't drop it, but, but this, you know, it's not, not real. So, but, you get, but these are um, cast from real. Uh, this is cast from a real egg. So this is a true size and a, a regular size. And this is the size, this is, you know, an adult bird's head. And you can get a sense for how big these guys are. So I'll pass these around. You guys can check them out. Uh, now they're big. They are our biggest surviving North American bird. They are huge. So they are, I'll show you some pictures with kids uh, for scale in a second, but huge wingspan. The adults, if the adult is just sitting here roosting, the adult from foot, from claw to top of the head, will be about a meter and a half. Big, big bird. Then when they start to fly and they spread their wings, like in the picture here on the left, um, they uh, huge, as much as a three meter, sometimes even slightly larger than a three meter wingspan. So huge birds. Um, sometimes, uh, as with many things in, say, a blue sky or a blue ocean, when we see them from afar, we maybe don't appreciate really how big they are. It's hard to get a sense of scale. Is that a... Is that a big bird that's far away or a slightly smaller one that's closer to us? But when you see one uh, in real life, they're amazing. And if you guys have not seen one, you can go up to our library uh, at your next break and go and look in the, in the uh, case on the, where is it? Is it on the left or right now? It used to be on the right. So I think it's on the left now? When you guys go back, it's first floor, floor first floor black, back, it's either right or left by one of the study areas. That's a juvenile that you'll see there. That's only about a one-year-old or so, one, one-and-a-half-year-old bird. So they take several years to get to full maturity and, and full size. Uh, they breed in 
up and down places. So they breed in uh, areas that have rocky cliff faces. They nest in, in nooks and crannies on, on a big giant cliff uh, or in uh, caves or in a hollowed out stump of a giant tree, that kind of stuff. So definitely vertical uh, places that are hard for other critters to get access to. Uh, in addition to where they breed, they also hang out and spy a lot, which we call a roost site. So they also need um, a high prominence area for them to roost. So that could be a ridge line of a, of a mountain, um, you know, the tops of dead trees, something with a great vantage point that is easy to launch off and start to glide and then flap their wings. Uh, they're typically, right now, getting ready to, if they haven't already, laid their egg for the year. Um, the, the egg will hatch and it'll take a couple months for, well, it'll actually take a couple months for that, that egg to hatch and then the baby is there, the chick is there and needs a lot of help from mom and dad. So we, we talk about a high level of parental investment. So if, if the parents bail on this chick, it's gonna die, no, no question. Um, so they hang out in the nest for about half a year where the parents are bringing food to them, regurgitating food that they've uh, uh, recovered uh, elsewhere. Then they um, uh, hang out uh, near the nest for um, about a, a little bit less than another half year, uh, learning to fly and, and, and getting ready to fly and all that kind of good stuff. Um, the maximum that we've seen, and so rarely do we hit the maximum, but the maximum we've seen is two chicks reared every three years. So these guys don't have the ability to pump out five babies, four babies, as do some species. Um, they, they, um, and, and this is, again is the max, so typically it's less than that. Typically it's more like maybe one every three years, or one and a half on average every three years. They have had a wide, as many of our formerly widespread critters, they have had a historically wide distribution in the past, but that, that, that territory that they occupy is really going to vary depending on the resource base that's accessible to them. Are there a lot of, are there a lot of uh, potential uh, carrion, potential dead things for them to eat? In which case, they don't need that as big a territory. Are they in an area with fewer carcasses and, and, and big things dying? Then they're gonna, on average, have a larger territory. So territories have varied from on the order of a little bit less than 1,000 square kilometers to north of 10,000 square kilometers. So large range, person magnitude ranges here. The farthest recorded flight in one day is um, two, is it, well, the recorded distance was 225 kilometers. So probably could easily go more than that. But that, that's a pretty good flight in one day. Uh, but as far as one trip, one going from point A to point B, um, we've recorded them going from Utah to Wyoming and um, with some GPS tracking. And so again, it was at least 643 kilometer travel. So these birds can move large distances. So knowing nothing else, for, thank you, knowing nothing else with the conservation challenges, things that are wide ranging are maybe gonna get more into trouble, right? They're gonna leave their maybe protected area, their forest area, and get into zones that might be um, uh, electric wires, hunters, cars, all that kind of stuff. Um, as I said, these guys feed on dead things. Uh, they'll pretty much feed on whatever they can find. But traditionally, in our inland areas, that's going to, mule deer is going to be one of their largest, most important things to feed on. Historically, probably tule elk as well, before we nuked our tule elk populations. Um, but they'll really eat anything. On the coast, we've actually now rediscovered, as we'll get into the recovery in a little bit, but um, as, as they've re-established in the central coast of California, in the coastal zone near the Ventana Wilderness, 
um, we've started to observe them eating dead marine mammals. So clearly marine mammals were an important part of their diet. Elephant seals, whales, stuff like that. Um, importantly, they're generally not eating or, 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 or feeding close to their nest. They're typically going somewhere else. So they have their nesting area, then they have their forage area, and those roosts are going to be closer to the forage area. Um, generally, they're feeding in grasslands and oak woodlands in the interior part of California. They're generally feeding along the coast, uh, on, along the beaches on, um, in, in coastal California. These guys uh, mate for a uh, you know, bond, male-female bond, and they stay together for long periods of time. You can't tell which is the male and which is the female just from looking at them from afar. They're not sexually dimorphic. The male isn't a different size, doesn't have different coloring, so you have to get up close and personal to figure out if these guys are male or female. The quickest way to see one of these mature guys is to look up and see um, a big giant thing flying. Yeah, that's funny. Isn't that funny? That was supposed to be funny. You guys didn't laugh, but okay. Um, is uh, uh, the white under feathers underneath their wing as adults. Now, the, now juveniles won't have that, but as adults you'll see that. And um, one thing that, one, the most common vulture we have here are our turkey vultures, and they do have a pink head and stuff, so if you glance at them, you might uh, uh, mistake them perhaps for um, a uh, different species. But um, one of the things you can tell is that uh, our eagles and our turkey vultures, they have a bit of a bend, if you look close, a bit of a bend in their wing. It's not, it's not, it's not more of a, it's not this sort of straight, broad, linear, um, wingspan of our condors. So if you see a bit of a bend in the wing, in the front of the wing, you know that's not a condor. If you see only black underneath the wings, probably not a condor. That could be a juvenile. Uh, and again, the biggest uh, diagnostic thing here is just how big these things are. But again, that can be hard to detect if they're way high up in the air. As we said before, they're an iconic critter here in California, and for that matter, increasingly the western U.S., and even down into northern Baja in Mexico. All kinds of examples here of how important they are. On the right-hand side is our, our state coin. Now, you guys probably won't remember this, but when we started making the state coin series, there was a competition. And so we vote, the voters, you guys, the citizens, were voting. We had a couple different options of the finalists. All, all were cool. Um, this is what won. The 2005 coin picture up here they have is the design that won. That won over Hollywood, over the San Francisco Bay Bridge, etc. So it's telling that Californians that wanted to symbolize California did not choose um, a, a human created structure as they easily could have and they were beautiful art it was beautiful artwork and stuff as well they chose Yosemite Valley John Muir and a condor to represent um, California in a, in a small space so that's that tells you something if we go up to the Pacific Northwest this totem in the middle here um, we see uh, the tops of many totem poles will have either an osprey or historically they had uh, you know things that were older had condors as their capping feature. Um, they've been featured on stamps, all kinds of stuff. There's a stuffed animal. Um, there's Condor Field. So this is Condor Field, an old airstrip. We have Condor Field here at CSUCI. Our, our runway where we fly our drones and things out in Camp Park is, 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 is Condor Field. So again, this iconic, how do we want to distinguish ourselves? What do we think about when we talk about flight or movement? Condors frequently come to mind. The Chumash, um, we're, we're big fans of the condor. The condor is a sacred uh, critter for them. 
And in that painted cave there, the red, the, the red bird, which is from a cave up in Santa Barbara, um, that's symbolizing a condor as well. And when we talk to school kids, um, they really uh, get jazzed on mountain lions and condors. And you can see, in this case, this is a felt uh, or, or piece of cloth tracing of uh, outline of an uh, adult condor in flight. And to give you a sense of scale for how big these birds are. So, you know, wow, the kids are like, what? That's super cool. So very much so an iconic creature. Here is a juvenile. Let me turn these lights down a little bit. Head is black. Right? It's, not, it's not gotten that pink uh, clearly distinguishing feature. This picture is taken in, in the Grand Canyon. Um, another distinct feature you'll see now if you're close enough to see them with binoculars, almost all, if not all, of our condors are tagged. Because they're so rare, because we've been working on recovering them, because we want to know more about them, a large fraction, if not all, depends on what area we're talking about, but almost all of them are tagged with um, some type of tracking device, either a GPS or a radio telemetry uh, a tracker, and that's that, that little purple thing back there on, on, his, on the back side of the bird. And then their wings also have these wing clips, or these wing tags. The number is important, as is the color. So the color and number, that combination, will tell you this is bird you know, X that came from, from this nest, etc. So we can, uh, from afar, recognize individuals. Here is a roost of these guys. In this case, this is, this is a bit of an older picture, so you see they're, they're using the older tags there, which is more of a handwritten number uh, on an orange background. But these guys were at a roost, so they're sitting there chilling, looking for food. Uh, here's some pictures that, um, when did I take these? I took these in 2008 uh, on the rim of the Grand Canyon. And uh, really cool to see lots of these birds accumulating and, and hanging out, as they historically did. So we're, we're seeing cool recovery. Should also say that the, the, there's a misimpression with these guys. A lot of people think they're, they're eating dead stuff, so they, they must be smelling dead stuff, right? They don't seem to have that great a sense of smell, at least not the kind of sense of smell that they could track things from you know, miles and miles away. Not like a grizzly bear's sensitivity, not like canine sensitivity, not like uh, cat's sensitivity. Um, so rather, they appear, these condors appear to find their prey by finding other things finding the prey. So these guys appear to, the roost sites appear to be important. And for example, on the rim of the Grand Canyon, a fantastic roost site, right? You can see a long distance. That when the crows start coming in, and the other uh, scavengers start coming in, that's, that appears to be how these guys are finding their prey. So that's why the, the visual field, the, the having a, large, a high vantage point is so central uh, for these guys when they're looking for dead stuff. Um, here's one uh, flying down uh, to the ocean uh, near uh, Big Sur. And uh, here is uh, these guys here are feeding on a dead elephant seal down here at the beach. This guy's feeding on a dead, uh, uh, I think that's a dead calf um, that was put there uh, to help these guys eat. Cool. Okay, what was the story with condors? Condors used to be much more widely distributed than they are now. We have clear fossil records dating for them uh, so Dr. Patch was just telling me yesterday that she took her family over, over the holiday break to um, the La Brea Tar Pits. Has anybody been to the La Brea Tar Pits? Yeah, super cool. If you guys haven't been, you must go. You must go over Christmas break if you've not been there. Um, we have some fantastic records of many things from the Tar Pits, from the Pleistocene, but uh, really great records of some of these birds as well. So. These guys existed alongside an even bigger uh, bird, essentially the same thing, uh, just a larger cousin, um, that had, had a four meter wingspan. So these guys lived alongside them. These were the smaller brothers, if you will, the smaller cousins of these guys that were doing the same thing, feeding on dead, uh, large bodied animals. 
during the Pleistocene, these guys covered an area from essentially here all the way uh, up to New York, from, the, from southern regions all the way up far north. Um, but then with uh, glaciation and, and shifts in distribution of ice and shifts in distribution of critters, large body critters, we see their ranges change. And so about 10,000 to 11,000 years ago, they disappear over most of the range. Unclear the exact driver of this, but there's uh, excellent, um, oh, well, I'll just say there's good evidence that this was part of the Pleistocene megafaunal die off. Did Dr. Steele talk to you guys about that? Yeah, okay, good. So good. So, right, this is this time, this, this megafauna extinction event we see all around the world pretty much when humans get to places. Uh, there's still some controversy because there's thing, many things were varying. The climate was changing as humans were invading these new ecological lands, communities and landscapes and seascapes. But um, they, there's a high degree of at least correlation there. In this case, these guys are feeding off of the big bodied animals. And so as those big bodied animals go extinct and become rarer, the things that are feeding on them uh, become rarer and, and shrink and disappear over a lot of their area. By the 1500s, they're restricted to only um, the west coast. And by the 1700s, they actually expand. Why, why might they have expanded their range into the southwest in particular? More roads. Not more roads. More large body animals dying like buffalo. That's right. That's right. So, so humans have come in and started to mess with stuff. And we started in the southwest with uh, Spain and Mexico and all this stuff bringing livestock into the southwest, into these relatively arid areas that at least recently before then hadn't supported large populations. Now we had you know, cattle and things and those cattle would die. And so food for potential food for um, condors. So we see a bit of an expansion in the 1700s. By the early 1800s, we know that they still remained at least as far north as the Columbia River Gorge. I'll tell you how we know that in a second. And, um, but, but then rapidly by the mid 1800s, by the time California becomes a state, they're extirpated from Washington and Oregon. Um, by the 1940s, they're extirpated from Northern Baja in Mexico. And so by the 1980s, at the entire global population is in Southern Santa Barbara and primarily here in Ventura County. So that's the big overview picture. Here's a map that I've put together. So this is my map. So this is this is the best guess. This is this is you know a qualitative map. But here the here that I just told you in words. Here's some examples and pictures. Late Pleistocene. Here's here's a, a painting from the uh, uh, artist's interpretation of what was going on. For example, in La Brea tar pits, and you see in the background there condors flying flying around. The above picture is that larger bodied cousin. Um, about 25% larger than um, our California condors that, that uh, was around then. And so the light green pattern there is the distribution of condor, of California condor, uh, you know, several thousands of years ago. By about 2,000 years ago, they start to be restricted from the eastern seaboard, and they become mostly a west and southwestern species. By the 1800s, they're restricted to the western west coast. We know they go as far north as the Columbia River Gorge because Lewis and Clark see them. And here, here's an excerpt from uh, Clark's journal from November 18th, 1805. He said, Reuben Fields, which is one of the, one of the parties on the core of discovery, um, Reuben Fields killed a buzzard of the large kind, measured from the tips of the wings across nine and a half feet, and then goes on to sketch it right here in his in his notebook so there's the only thing that could possibly have been with that large a wingspan was a california condor so we know that at least at that time when the lewis and clark guys shot it <laughs> what else are you gonna do uh, uh that they existed at least as far north as the columbia river but by uh habitat fragmentation uh screwing with populations all this and that 
um, all, the, all the regular uh, culprits here. By the late 70s, really by the, by the mid 50s, but, but, but by the late 70s, um, the condor are restricted to our part of California. What you see there is this classic U-shaped pattern, this pink, pink dotted shape that I've shown. That's the potential habitat for condor. The, the, so, the, so they might be foraging in any of those areas. So they're going up the Tehachapi's, they're going up the, into the Sierra Nevada, and they're going on the coast range. Um, the the um, red area is where they potentially could be nesting, and then the pink is the highest concentration of nests. Uh, this pink on this side of the, of the figure. So that they could, they could be found anywhere in that U-shape, but really they were um, laying eggs and stuff just in these, these few patches down here uh, on the south coast. And here is some of the data from a few years ago. Um, this is, this is post-recovery, so this is, this is not what it was like in 1979 or anything, but, but it gives you a sense of here are a individual, each dot is an individual reporting of a, a lo location of a bird, so you can see they're following that U-shape pattern. How many were there? So that was, that was distribution. Let's talk about numbers. Um, the first time we did a quantitative estimate of these guys was in the late 1930s. And the numbers we came up with somewhere between 60 and 100 birds. So as we see so often, problem, problem, problem. Oh my god, right? The old guys, hey, you should be so many of these things. Really, Grandpa? Yeah, we better count them. By the time we get to doing uh, robust, statistically defensible surveys, we've oftentimes departed greatly from the historic abundances. So um, that was the case here, but, but nevertheless, 60 to 100, 1939. Um, when we listed them, uh, now note, these guys were listed before we have our modern Endangered Species Act. This is, the, this is one of the, the predecessor um, uh, pieces of legislation. So the, the date there is 1976 or 1967, excuse me, because the Endangered Species Act goes into effect in 1973. But in 1967, we list them. At that time, we, we estimate somewhere between 50 and 60 birds are alive. This big, important, historically important conference happened in 1975, where everybody that was worried about this, bird advocates, scientists, everybody came together. At that time, the best estimate was somewhere between 25 and 35 birds, and everybody was freaking out. They were, they were saying, oh my God, you know, 20 years ago we had about twice as many birds, now there's half as many, we better do something, because they're, they're on the steep, steep slide to extinction. Another survey in 1982 finds 21, 1985 we find nine, or, or there were nine left in the wild, I should say. Um, and when we captured the last wild one to bring into captive breeding, more on that in a second, um, we, uh, we, we removed them from the wild in 1987. So if you were a birder, a bird nerd, is there, are there any bird nerds in here besides, besides uh, my bird nerd in the front? So one of the key things with people that really like to go sight birds and, and collect observations, only wild birds count. You can't go to a zoo and see this rare bird and then put that on your life list. I, you saw that. You have to see it in the wild. Not only do you need to see it in the wild, you need to see a wild-born bird in the wild. So starting in 1987, if you had not seen a condor, you were not going to see a condor for a while. Um, it, it, didn't, it didn't meet the definition of what birders think of as, as observing birds. Uh, by 1988, we have the first successful captive breeding at the San Diego Zoo, and then from there we just start getting better and better and better and better and better and able to rear these, these guys in captivity. The overall overview of the management of condor, of modern condor management, um, is one, uh, as we've seen with other critters, originally this thing is seen as a threat, originally this thing is seen as a bad thing. Why? Well, why might people see these guys as, as undesirable critters? Right, so, so we see them feeding on, say I'm a, I'm a rancher that has sheep, I see this guy feeding on sheep, I don't like that, right? 
Anything else? Any other reason? They're not cute and cuddly. <laughs> They're not cute and cuddly. They put their head in the dead rot and stuff. That's like not, you know, Hallmark <laughs> channel movie <laughs> material kind of stuff typically. Right. So they're also associated with death, right? Which is, um, in many cases with our Western society, that's considered something you don't want to think about, don't want to talk about, something that feeds off of dead things, that sounds icky and things like that. So for all those reasons, they're considered a, a varmint or an undesirable, if you will. Um, but things begin to change, as we see so many in so many instances, when they start to become rarer and rarer. Our first hint that something is shifting is 1908. In Los Angeles County, a guy shoots a condor and a judge fines the guy 50 bucks. And that was a lot of money for the day. But more importantly, the very fact that a judge would say, hey, that's a messed up thing, is notable. Um, the last time we saw a bird in Arizona, before our current management efforts, was 1924. How do we know? Because this guy shot one. Saw it, shot it, boom. Okay, well I guess they were there, at least they were. Um, movement to do something about this, do something about this, do something about this. Protected area set-asides are one of the first approaches. Let's see if we can make an area where these guys won't be shot at, etc. So the first one is in Sisquoc. Um, a county, so it's the Sisquoc County uh, Condor Sanctuary. It's run by the U.S. Forest Service, and it's uh, 480. It was 486 hectares set up before World War II. That then leads to our, our conducting the first, as I mentioned before, the first rigorous um, uh, scientific estimate of what's going on. The conclusions from that report. Right, which is you know 70, 80 years ago now, was shooting people outright, hunting it, blow them away, blowing them away, poisoning, oftentimes actively poisoned to try to kill them and get rid of them with with all kinds of nasty things, um, or or poison bait or poison carcasses, and then um, reduced area where they can live, so fr habitat fragmentation, habitat loss for them were the main uh, drivers of this decline. And that really hasn't changed a whole lot since then, um, with the possible exception of the shooting part has dropped down and the poisoning is, is now the big thing. Um, and then we, we established uh, our current uh, gold standards condor sanctuary here in the Sespe, here in Ventura County, in 1947. When we first established it, it was uh, 14, a bit over 14,000 hectares. It's expanded since then. Okay. 1950 to 1970, uh, we're getting more serious. We expand that condor sanctuary um, by about 70, 75%. San Diego, so 1952, remember I, I said, we, so we said we, we captured the last one in, in the late 80s. In the early 50s, people are already thinking about, hey, how can we help this species? How, what can we do here? One thought is, hey, maybe we can bring them into a human controlled environment we can control some of the variables, control the predators, things like that, and see if we can boost their reproductive output. And so that, that's proposed. So um, uh, we start with uh, looking at some examples elsewhere. So a very similar species, the Andean condor, very similar ecology down in South America, provided a model. Those guys weren't threatened. So that we weren't as worried about if we accidentally offed one of those guys, like we'd feel bad, right, and it would be a bummer, but we wouldn't be worried about the species. So the, so the Andean condor provides an important model, an experimental system we can play with and try things out and not worry about losing one of our precious condors. Importantly, one of the things we figure out there is this notion of double clutching. Does anybody know what double clutching is? So these birds live up, as I mentioned, in the big high cave or top of a rock, whatever, far away, right? We're not talking about a seagull nest on the, on the, you know, a dune or something like that at the beach. So if a bird, I don't know, gets super excited and flips around and jumps around, potentially could knock the egg out and that egg drops straight down and dies, right? So clearly, in the history of this bird living on cliffs, 
that is a potential risk. So what happens is, since these birds are monogamous, right, they're staying together, so the male and females are, are hanging out together. If early, so mom lays an egg, if early in that cycle, if the egg cracks or dies or falls away, the female will immediately go into estrus again and she'll lay another egg. So in one season, you could actually get two eggs. Now, mom, the mom would never, it never lay two eggs, but you can essentially pump out a replacement egg. And so we use that natural history to our advantage. So we let these guys lay an egg, then we steal it, whoop! And then she has another egg, right? So we steal it, put that egg in an incubator, right? And so we trick the biology of the system into making more critters than they would otherwise in nature. So that's called double clutching. Uh, and, and, and in the wake of this, uh, the San Diego Zoo, you know, figuring out how to do this and need and stuff, they get, some, they get a permit to um, uh, get a couple juveniles and bring them into captivity, and the Audubon Society freaks out. They say, no way, you guys don't know how to do this, you want to take two birds in the wild when there's hardly any left and experiment with them? No way. So that permit then gets revoked. They get their first legal protection at the, in the state of California in 1953. And so therefore it becomes unlawful to, to take uh, a condor in any way, shape, or form. So take meaning both kill, obviously, but also harass or disturb in any way. So these guys get state protection in the 1950s. 1965. Um, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, unfortunately it's their office in, in Maryland, but, but their, their division that handles big birds like this, they set up a research unit starting to focus on condors. Right? So this is going to provide important quantitative uh, analysis, scholarly research, etc. to understand the, the ecology of this critter. As I said before, they're listed in 1967 under the, the predecessor of the Endangered Species Act. Um, in 1967, um, we have a wounded bird, Topa Topa, and uh, we take him into captivity in the LA Zoo, try to rehabilitate him and release him. Basically, long story short, he doesn't fly right, we can't let him go. So we keep him. And that bird has become an, an incredibly important part of our captive uh, rearing um, uh, program. Still alive. 40, 40, I believe 49 years old or something last time I checked, I think is what, it, what the age was. So these are long live birds. Okay, now we start to get into the exciting times. So um, we, California lists it in 1971 uh, on the California version of, of you know, the Endangered Species Act, our state version of the Endangered Species Act. We established the Hopper Mountain National Wildlife Reserve. Now, I used to take you guys here as part of Cons Bio. I haven't, I, I haven't done that in several years, but um, it's a great trip. Has anybody been to Hopper Mountain? So it's really cool. It takes a whole day, and we got to go up this crazy road and everything. Have a rental car and a rental van and stuff. But um, it's uh, it's really cool. If you guys get the chance, I would encourage you to go check it out. We've had several of our graduates go work for Fish and Wildlife Service in Ventura and to work with uh, the folks over there. And it's, it's, a, it's a great, uh, great project. Uh, Hopper Mountain is established as a buffer around the existing sanctuary, um, particularly for areas where they can roost and look for prey. So an important add-on there. By 1975, we also create the first recovery plan Remember, with the Native Species Act, first you say, oh, is there a problem? Let's look and investigate, see if there's a problem. Then we determine, oh my gosh, there is a problem. These critters are getting more rare, or they or, or they're soon will be extinct. And if we go through that whole process and get them designated, the next step is to make, legally we are supposed to make a plan to get these guys off the list. The goal is not to protect, perennially protect these critters. The goal is to get their populations to a stable state. So the recovery plan is the first step uh, to doing that. Um, part of that, uh, we designate uh, critical habitat areas where they, that they would need. We have another conference, so we have that first conference in 1975, we have another one in 1979, 
And unfortunately, there's a bunch of bickering. There's a bunch of infighting. So um, nobody can agree on what to do. Some people want to go and bring all of these wild birds into captivity. Some people want to leave them all out there. And do, so the only thing we can agree upon is let's do more monitoring. But what, what we're allowed to do is do a little bit more aggressive monitoring, meaning the agreement from the group is that, okay, it's okay to go and maybe climb up to some of these nests and go in and weigh some of the chicks and stuff like that to get some additional data that um, is not just pure passive looking at them from far away. So we start to do that. Uh, we get a special designation by US, US Congress back when Congress functioned and actually listened to science and things we call facts. They said, oh my God, we should do something. And so they, um, they uh, essentially um, get, gave some more money and some special designations to really help that field program and to get some data and to expedite the, the uh, work that goes into the recovery plan. Uh, again, the, the research center is, is expanded in 1980, and it includes uh, uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and Audubon jo joining the USGS. Um, in 1980, the Depart California Department of Fish and Game starts this long-term field research effort that, again, some of, you, some of your predecessors have been involved with, um, that involves everything from capturing telemetry. This is where we start doing the initially radio tracking and now GPS tracking of, of organism of individuals. Um, unfortunately, in doing this, uh, a chick is killed. There are risks. There are risks. This is very hard. So, so to be clear, I have very strong opinions on this. Um, I think we must accept risk and go forward. There are many folks in our increasingly litigious society that anytime there's a risk, they say, mm, no, mm, no. Uh, there's many people that say, you guys should not go out in the outside of the classroom because the classroom is safer, right? I completely disagree. I think to really understand our natural world, to really understand our management of our world, we need to get out and do stuff. And sometimes that might involve you twisting an ankle or getting hurt or having risk to organisms. We do everything we can to minimize that, but that's part of the deal. In this environment, though, recall, there was great dissension amongst the government scientists, the academic scientists, the NGOs, the Native American community, all of that. It, 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 it's, everybody said, well, OK, I guess we'll do this. And there was a problem, immediately revoke, stop, er, ground to a halt. And uh, you know, um, that's, it, that's what happened. But that's, that was unfortunate. Um, a year later, San Diego um, Wild Animal Park and, and the LA Zoo are, are collaborating now uh, intensively over condor breeding. Um, they uh, are given a permit to capture three condors. So that dies down after about a year and they say, hey, look, these things are going to be going away. We need to grab this genetic material. So they're allowed to take three. Um, in 1982, they have their first wild chick successfully hatched and grow up. Great. Good times. Now we know we can at least theoretically do this. Um, we've done it with the Andean condors. Now we're doing it with, the, with these guys. Great. We start to see the first signs of lead poisoning as being a significant mortality source uh, in 1984. It was clearly going on before now, but we really start to recognize it in 1984. We pull this bird in, measure it, do a necropsy, and uh, very high levels of lead are in the blood of this critter. Given the small size, given the risk from lead poisoning, um, that, that freaks everybody out. And they go, okay, I guess we better go pull these guys in. Um, and so the, U the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service petitions to uh, pull in all the remaining birds, and then the, Ch the Chumash say, no way. This is a sacred symbol to us. This is a, this is a holy critter, and you're just going to go pull them out, out of nature? That doesn't work for us. So some more negotiations ensue, and we uh, decide to go ahead with the plan, but we always have a tribal representative with us. So when we capture these individuals, there's a, a person there doing a blessing and observing, making sure we're being respectful for the critters. When we release the critters, also we have tribal representatives, we have a blessing, we have a ceremony, all that kind of great stuff. And so they are fundamentally part of the recovery process, which is awesome, right? Um, 
there is unfortunately a strand in conservation biology historically that has said only the scientists know what the hell's going on. And we don't really need to talk to the local communities. We don't really need to talk to the First Nation peoples that, you know, you know we need to go explain stuff to them as opposed to truly partnering with them. And the great thing about this, not initially, but by the time we get to the end, it truly is a partnership amongst NGOs, government sector, academics, uh, First Nation peoples, everybody. So it's, it's, it's a great example of that now. It didn't start that way, but it's evolved into a really uh, wonderful model. Uh, April 19th, 1987, um, we pull the last condor out of the wild, and so we now have 27 birds alive on the planet, and that's it, all of which are in captivity. This is how it works. This, this, so we bring these guys in, we rear them. Um, we really have to be careful of imprinting. We don't want these birds to like people. We want them to be afraid of people and go away from people. So that includes in the whole rearing process, uh, hiding people from them as much as is practically possible. So in this case, on the upper left-hand corner, what you see is a little chick who's been hatched. And in this case, there's the, um, this was one of the, double, one of the first double clutches, so he's not with his mom, because right, the mom only has one at a time. So we're, we're hand rearing this critter, and so we're doing that with a puppet. So that's a rubber puppet, or latex puppet. And um, the person is hiding behind that blue, uh, uh, um, whatever it is, cardboard thing, wall thing, so that they're doing all this such that the chick doesn't see the person. Right? So now you're going to feed him, going to give him nourishment, all that kind of stuff without ever um, getting in front of his eyeballs or her eyeballs. We do that till the birds get to be uh, you know, juvenile stage. Then once they get to, to juvenile stage, we take them out to one of our release sites. More about that in a second. But release sites. And so we get them out there. And again, we've learned all this the hard way. We've learned all this by not doing this right initially. Um, initially, we just sort of took these birds and said, go fly! And the bird's like, what the hell is that? I don't, that doesn't look good. I want to stay here where people, where puppets give me food, right? So there's a whole learning process. What we know now is we bring these guys out. We leave them in the area for a while so they get accustomed to the, to the conditions and seeing the surroundings, etc. Then we start, we migrate them into different uh, increasingly larger sized pens. So here these guys are learning to, to fly because they've been in mostly constrained areas. Um, in zoos, so they can start flying in these relatively small raceway areas and then larger areas and larger areas and eventually we can open the door and they can just fly off on their own. Um, okay, so post bringing them into captivity, this is what happened. So, um, so we have this increasingly successful breeding. We don't have to do artificial insemination or anything now. We, we, we got the birds able to mate on their own. They've bonded, um, and we, then we start taking these Andean condors. Remember, we used them primarily in the how do you make eggs kind of side of it. Now we're working on how do you release them side of it. So we take these juvenile Andean condors and use them as surrogates to, um, to, to one, figure out how to release them, but then two, have adult birds around to essentially show the young birds how to behave, how to hang out in a roost, right? So we're using these non-native critters as a surrogate for our extirpated natives. And so uh, that goes on for a while. Um, we, released, uh, we start releasing uh, condors in 1992 into the wild. Two men shoot at one of them, and that guy gets fined two months and has to pay 1,500 bucks. In my opinion, fantastically, not that, that wasn't... Uh, I thought that was a bit low for threatening the extinction of a species that's been on Earth for hundreds of thousands of years, but that's my personal opinion. Um, and then another one, shortly after that, another one dies from drinking coolant. And unclear entirely what happened. It's possible someone just left out a bunch of coolant, I guess. Or it's possible that people, again, that don't like these varmints, didn't want these varmints coming back, put out poison traps. And um, there's a couple different versions of, of uh, coolant you can get. The traditional kind actually tastes sweet. 
So it's a real poisoning hazard for things like coyotes and dogs and stuff because they taste it and they, mm, I'm gonna drink some of that and it's actually toxic to them, so they ingest it. Um, and so that appears to be what happened with this, uh, this one condor. Uh, we, start, we start expanding the releases in 1993 and uh, we establish this new rearing facility in 95 at, at Hopper Mountain. And we get the experimental designation, more on that in a second, in 1996, which is important under the, the Federal Endangered Species Act. And that experimental population um, designation allows us to expand efforts in Arizona, Utah, and Nevada. And in the immediate wake of that, in 1996, we start releasing condors back into Arizona uh, around the Grand Canyon. The next year, we start releasing them in the Ventana Wilderness up in Big, up in Big Sur. In 1999, one of the birds that we released in Arizona is shot and killed. The, the hunter gets one year probation, 200 hours community service, and is fined 3,200 bucks. Again, in my opinion, that seems a little small. What happened with the, them in the Big Sur after the fire recently? Ooh, great question. Um, uh, they seem to mostly have been okay, but I, I don't have the most recent data from this last summer. But the previous one in 2007, the previous big fire, they seem to do okay. Um, remember that these guys are feeding on dead things, and especially those guys in the coastal area, they're feeding a lot in the immediate coastal zone. So they're a little bit protected. They're not like, say, a more traditional forest bird where that fire comes through and burns up all its forage or all, all its nesting sites. So they're, they're a bit uh, robust, probably, in that sense, uh, compared to other critters. Uh, Okay, and then importantly, in 1999, this is the kind of stuff that I get super excited about, and everybody else is like, what the hell is that? That seems kind of boring lame. But uh, this one individual, Y-130, goes from Lion Canyon in Santa Barbara up to Big Sur for a few days, and then comes back. That's cool. We have our Santa Barbara slash Ventura population. We have our Central California population. This is showing that these populations can exchange individuals, that we can get some genetic movement, that if something goes wrong, or, or there is a fire, let's say, that, that has some impact on one of the populations, in theory, at least, they can self-rescue. They can self-recover um, uh, themselves. So that was, that's really, whew, that's awesome, man. That gets me excited, that's cool. All right, let's talk about experimental population designation, and then we can take a little break, if you guys need a break. Um, so this is a really important thing. Somebody tell me about the Endangered Species Act. What, is it, what does the Endangered Species Act prevent or, or not allow you to do? Take. Take, right? And take is defined as? Anything. Take is defined as anything. Take is not just to physically take my cup into the other room, but to have the legal interpretation of the word take is to have any impact. If I walk up to that bird, and that bird's heart starts beating, that, that, that's a disturbance on that bird, that's considered a take. So we're not allowed to mess with these organisms in any way, shape, or form, right? Why is, why is that a potential barrier to restoring endangered species? Or why might that be? Oh, right, good. Okay, so yeah, so once so we as the researcher folks, we need to be able to pick up the birds and mess with them. Right, so we can get a special permit for us as the recovery people that allow us to do that. So good. But thinking more broadly, outside the restoration community or the conservation biology community, why might the Endangered Species Act be perceived as a hurdle to recovery? It brings in the feds instead of being handled here locally. Okay, yeah, that is true. So, so more bureaucracy, but what else? Something even more fundamental than that. It's hard to support them if you never see them, and the public isn't supposed to be around them. Uh, kind of. I mean, yes, that's true. What Hunter's saying is true. But if I'm a hunter, if, if, I, if I'm a guy, let's take a more extreme example, field mice. Let's say there's an endangered field mouse. It's in, it becomes endangered. We can't do any take to it, right? We can't spook it, we can't whatever. And it's extinct from, from my home. 
and now these government scientists want to come start putting these guys around and releasing them near my home? What the hell, right? Then the regular activities I'm used to doing, maybe that's driving to school and back, that starts to become problematic, right? Because what if I accidentally drive over one of these mice that it was running across the road? I, I wasn't trying to hurt it necessarily, but now that's a, federal, that's a felony, the fact that I drove over one of these individuals, right? So this protection, which we think of as a good thing, as we're trying to expand the population, grow it, put it back in its pla the places where it's been extirpated from, now people are like, whoa, 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 whoa. Don't think so, because I don't want to get in trouble for doing my routine stuff. You guys with me? That's what the experimental population designation was designed to solve. So the idea is that this is going to give us greater management flexibility. We can declare the area around my house a so-called experimental population, meaning it is not a core population, meaning that we, have, uh, we can have less um, onerous restrictions on, on, on those critters and on maybe people's unintentional impact on those critters. So we can say, okay, check it out. Yeah, we're gonna put the mice by your house, but here's the deal, it's experimental. If you accidentally drive, don't try to drive over them, right? If we find evidence that you're actively like, you know, hanging out and trying uh, to go right, go left, trying to squish them, then you're in trouble. But if you're just going about your regular daily commute and you accidentally drove over them, you won't be, we're not gonna, you know, put you in jail and charge you thousands of bucks, right? That's key, because now people are like, eh, okay. Well, maybe I'll let it, maybe, you know, maybe it can happen now, right? So the experimental population was, was um, an amendment to the Endangered Species Act, so it changed the original one. It wasn't in the original legislation. It came into effect in 1982. And it said we can designate something as an experimental population if that population is geographically, is physically separated from a non-experimental population. So you have to have at least some populations in, or at least one population in the the distribution of the species that is not experimental, that is, that is a regular standard population. If we want to add ones on, we can add them to this experimental designation, add them as this experimental designation. And it also, you, you can only do that if, if this so-called experimental designation will further, further the management goals, the conservation goals of the recovery of this, of this organism. And so like I said before, it really increases our flexibility and allows us to work with ranchers and other people. There's two flavors. There is an essential so-called experimental population. I've never seen an example of that. I know of no example of that. So that was kind of like, you know, in the, book, in the books it says you can do that. I don't know what the hell that is. Um, all the examples that we have are so-called non-essential experimental populations. And who knows what that means? Who knows? Uh, grizzly bear, we, so we, we've established a non um, uh, we've established experimental populations of grizzly bears, of whooping cranes, gray wolves, and most recently Colorado pike minnow um, in the, to the east of us. And for example, here is the area in Arizona. It bleeds up into Utah. This is the area of the Grand Canyon. This whole area is designated an experimental um, population. And for example, this was central to the whooping crane recovery, this experimental population designation. In this case, these whooping crane cover the entirety of the, the distance of the US. They go from Canada down into Texas. And so without this key designation, it, was, it would have been really hard to establish additional breeding populations elsewhere. Um, but, but we're able to do that with the experimental designation um, unit. And the same thing for gray wolf recovery. Uh, the gray wolf is another story that's been complicated by the fact that uh, they've been de downlisted and some states like to blow away gray wolves. But, but in the initial recovery process of gray wolves, the experimental designation process was key. So, so this has been a useful tool, a, a very important modification of the Endangered Species Act that allows the Endangered Species Act to work better. And here again, here's that area in, in uh, Arizona, which is primarily uh, the Grand Canyon and is a perfect place for condors and they've um, taken to it really well. 